today we're continuing our series of episodes looking at the intersection of parenting and food. Recently, we heard from Dr. Michael Gorin, who's co-author of the new book, Sugar Proof, The Hidden Dangers of Sugar That Are Putting Your Child's Health at Risk and What You Can Do, where we discussed the research and what that says about the impact that sugar has on our bodies and our children's bodies. But when I was looking around to see who is looking at issues uh, related to sugar that are beyond just what those are that are happening in the body and really lifting their head up and looking at the broader social and cultural issues, I found the work of today's guest, Dr. Karen Throsby. Dr. Throsby is Associate Professor of Gender Studies at the University of Leeds in England. She obtained a bachelor's degree from Lincoln College, Oxford, and completed a master's and PhD from the Gender Institute, London School of Economics. Her research explores the intersections of gender, technology, the body, and health, and explores how bodily transformations happen and what this says about the wider social context they live in. She's currently working on a book called Sugar Rush, Science, Obesity, and the Social Life of Sugar, which begins from the question, what are the social meanings and practices of sugar in the context of a war on obesity? She focuses less on the truths about the dietary debates on sugar, but instead uses it to think about how scientific knowledge is produced, validated, and used, our panics around health and body size, and the politics of food and its lived inequalities. Welcome, Dr. Throsby. Thank you very much for having me. And I was, we were just having a little chat before we started. And I was saying that whenever we get a sociologist on the show, I always feel completely out of my depth. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I acknowledge that I, I very much approach these questions from a psychologist perspective. Yeah. And, and I've invited Dr. Throsby to push back when I'm asking these, these questions in a way that's really different from the way that she sees them. So one of the, the major threads that runs through your work is this idea of addiction and sugar being addictive. And I guess I'm curious, why, why do you start there? And, and then we can sort of talk about what does it mean to be addicted to something and can we be addicted to sugar? And I know there's a hundred directions we can go from there, but mm. let's start with, with that as an overarching concept. Yeah, sure. So and I think just to take a little step back from that is yeah. to think about the project that I've done, the research that I've done, which, was a, which is a study of uh, primarily newspaper coverage of sugar. Um, from about 2013 up to the up to the present, uh, which is when you start to get an increased interest in sugar as like so, as sort of the dietary enemy of the day, um, and so I was, and then I looked at um, uh, um, like self help books, diet books, public health campaigns, official, you know, anything I could find from those um, from the sort of within that time period, and what I'm interested in is is how sugar is talked about. Um, and how it's kind of represented and what kind of role it's playing, what function is sugar playing as an enemy um, or as a sort of a site of pleasure and so on. And so this is how I came across this, these constant references to sugar as addictive. Um, and it, it's, it's used in a very unquestioning way, particularly in newspaper coverage, which cites it as a, a kind of known truth. Mm -hmm. Sugar is addictive. And, and therefore, and, and in a sense, the therefore is what I'm interested in. Therefore, what? If it is addictive, if the, we are claiming that it is addictive, what does that mean? And so for me, there's a number of questions that come out of that. I think, firstly, um, what does it mean to say that something is addictive? When, when you look at the scientific literature, there is very little agreement about what constitutes addiction. And at the moment, we're kind of moving towards a sort of neuroscientific interpretation of it. But there's no consensus around that really either. And it changes sort of it, it sort of um, evolves how we think about it, about addiction and what what counts as a potential site of addiction. So it's not just substances. Now there's a kind of expansion of what we consider to, to food, to um, online environments to twitter to you know to all those things and so for me i'm interested in it because it's it's given a great amount of certainty that we all know what it means to say that sugar is addictive when in fact if you sort of scratch below the surface there's very little certainty there so my question then is so what is it doing what is that claim doing when a journalist says but it is addictive or an anti-sugar kind of activist says it, what is being done? And for me, um, I think it does two key things, um, uh, both of them not well, in my view. The first <laughs> one is that it, um, it suggests that if we can pin it down as addictive, we then know what to do about it, right? Or we should just treat it like drugs. 
for example. Which we, well, can, course, we know what to do with, right? We can fix that problem. <laughs> because, you know, as, as if there is no problem with drugs yeah. and addiction, yeah. you know, so we don't really know what it yeah. means. Um, it doesn't give us a solution necessarily. Um, and it also, and I think this is its primary function, is to create a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. Um, so sort of rhetorically, it functions, the claim that it's addictive functions as a, a, this, this urgent claim that something must be done. And what that does then, it authorizes a series of interventions that don't need to be proven in order to be enacted because it's urgent. Mm. It's an urgent problem. And, and it creates... Um, in this case, sugar, which is usually the problem that's being addressed is fatness, um, which also we don't really understand very well either. Um, and, and it creates this sense of urgency that pulls against the need to stop and think about what are we actually doing socially when we intervene in these um, practices, these, these eating practices in this case. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So thank, thank you for setting the scene on that. And, and I want to sort of go into a number of those areas. Your, your first sort of contention that we don't really know what addiction is. Um, and, and also the idea that uh, what, how we think about addiction has really changed over time. And, and digging through the references in some of your papers, you know, I, I wasn't familiar with, with this, this uh, suite of literature, but uh, seeing how from the 1930s, where addiction is really seen as this kind of moral flaw in people, moving towards this, uh, this neuropsychological model, and then mm -hmm. which potentially ignores the, the social context of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so somebody is not, a, addicted in isolation can, can you kind of trace that for us and and what how does that link to sugar yeah yeah i mean i think i think one of the quite important things is that in those changes that have happened say from a a, a very kind of moral judgment about personal failings through to this very kind of biologized um vision where it's kind of written into the body in a way that we can't be responsible for um that actually we never leave those earlier models behind and actually we can see with addiction drug addiction say or alcoholism or a presumed addiction to sugar there is a massive amount of blame attack and kind of moral judgment attached to individuals who and i'm certainly not saying that that things that are kind of recognizable or known as addiction i'm, I'm not saying they don't exist i'm not saying we you know people are not um kind of under the under the kind of sphere of alcohol or drugs in in terrible traumatic ways yeah um but it's you know it's it we never leave these other judgments behind and then we do judge people who are addicted to all kinds of things although in different ways to different kinds of substances yeah um there are kind of acceptable addictions like to exercise for example it's much more mm -hmm. acceptable than cocaine um and so i think there's there's that shift but also i think for me it it kind of tells us that we have to be really careful with any attempt to define. Um, not that de definitions don't have functions, and we have to kind of have provisional definitions for lots of things, but we have to be really careful with those and ask who is being excluded and who is being brought into the center of vision, who then becomes the focus of intervention Mm. And I think where sugar is concerned, this becomes really important because some people and certain groups of people are seen as more liable to be kind of seduced by sugar than others. Yeah. And it's incredibly classed and it's incredibly gendered. Um, and so I think as soon as we start thinking about those those models, we need to think about who are they speaking about? Who is considered vulnerable? in those in those kind of definitions and in those models who becomes the target of intervention and surveillance mm -hmm. um, when we're kind of deciding what counts as addiction yeah and and so and just sort of uh thinking about the the neuropsychological view of uh addiction then and it, it seems like if if it's something that's inside ourselves that we can't help then the the most appropriate way to deal with that is to deal with supply 
And, and mm -hmm. if you can cut off the supply, then the person won't have to deal with their, their brain's inability to cope with whatever is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've seen that play out in the story of drug addiction and, mm -hmm. uh, and that we're now also seeing that related to sugar and, and thinking about Dr. Gorin's book, where we're talking mm -hmm. about reducing yeah. the quantity of sugar that we're taking yeah. in um, and, and things like soda taxes and, and those mm -hmm. kinds of mechanisms, companies voluntarily reduce Reducing the amount of sugar and salt yeah. in, in their foods. Uh, so, so we're seeing this play out already. Uh, what implications does that have if, if what we're saying is that, that a neuropsychological view of addiction is not necessarily the right way of looking at it because it's ignoring all these cultural and social factors? I mean, it's, 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 I mean there, there are many appealing aspects to this kind of neuroscientific approach to it in that it by saying it's it's actually kind of it's not a matter of willpower for example mm -hmm. is it you're saying it, that if you're saying it's kind of about how the brain is structured and operating that it's kind of beyond your control in some way that's not just a failure of will it's not a, a moral failure right. in that sense um and so it has a lot of appeal i think um and i think in many ways it's been mobilized as an attempt to try and shift blame away from individual failings um, to think about the broader structures that might expose people to particular drugs or uh, foods or or whatever but i think the the analogy between drugs like cocaine and uh, or even tobacco and um sugar kind of starts to break down in these terms because you can't abstain from food <laughs> you can you can control what is some people are in a position to control what is in their food to some extent mm -hmm. but you can you could if you i know a lot of people do completely remove added sugar for example but they're still eating sugar they're still eating you know they're still and so you 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 never you can't abstain in the same way you can certainly reduce um, but we think about that very, we don't think about, wouldn't it be great if people had slightly less cocaine? We, we think about them as they need to stop having cocaine because you can't have a little bit. And a lot of people feel the same about tobacco, for example, you have to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and so on. And alcoholics obviously are told, you know, you must not have any. And so I think this is where the analogy breaks down. So in the UK, when Action on Sugar, which is an anti-sugar sort of um, organization in the UK um, they launched in in uh, 2014 and and they kind of launched with the taglines that sugar is the new tobacco uh, which was a direct invocation of addiction mm -hmm. of, of addictive properties plus health harms from yeah. then from then consuming but even actually so, um, Graham McGregor Professor Graham McGregor who's the chair of Action on Sugar sort of later on in the in the newspaper commentaries kind of said yeah but, and we know it's not really like tobacco <laughs> it's like it's different but but we said it for emphasis right <laughs> so you know so you can see it um again it kind of circles back to this um the effect of it the social effect of saying that it's addictive is is like flagging up a great big warning um and also at the same time still actually even through the neuroscientific model shifting responsibility back onto the individual it's your responsibility as an individual then to to know the dangers of sugar and to find ways to restrict your consumption and make to make the right choices and so even though it, it seems to lift the responsibility, like almost all environmental arguments about sugar, about soda taxes and everything, in the end, they always, it always comes back to individual choices mm -hmm. that you, you could stop it if you wanted to. Yeah. Which for me is, is part of the problem of the way that sugar is being figured. Why is that part of the problem? Because it ignores the social context within which consumption occurs and if we look for example at people living um, in poverty um, with very little choice over how to eat when to eat what to eat um, because of lack of money lack of time they're often working multiple jobs um, might not be able to afford to put 
uh, to have a fridge, might not be able to afford to put the oven on. Um, you know, there's over a million children eating out of food banks in the UK. It's a, you know, though by making it a matter of individual choice and by focusing on sugar, I think this for me is another problem of talking so explicitly about sugar is that it closes down the other conversations that I think we need to be having, which are about inequality and poverty. And so you often hear people will say, you know, okay, people who are poor are more likely to be fat and more likely to have higher sugar consumption. Yes, and that's fairly well documented, but a kind of govern a government policy response to that is usually, ah, so we must target the poor people with our anti-sugar, anti-fat interventions, yeah. rather than saying, how can we make people less poor? And so I think by focusing so exclusively on sugar, as the problem to be solved, it actually um, stops the conversation going any further. Oh, we can't sort that, but we'll do this. Right. So yeah. that's kind of, that's, that's my concern about it really. Yeah, definitely hearing echoes of our conversation with Dr. Linda Bacon, where we talked about- Absolutely, I'm issues. sure. Yeah, related yeah. to the view of fatness and uh, yes. and how that shows up and uh, that poverty is absolutely an, an issue that is intimately collected, connected to that. And yes, it's it's seen as a, a moral failing when somebody is fat and that, yeah, we should, we should target them with messaging to say, and don't be fat, <laughs> yeah. rather than addressing the structural issues that are, are really at play, so. So, yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, and so so coming back again to to um, to this issue of addiction and yeah, and one of the, the things that you, you really pulled out, you, you, you were just talking about tobacco and, and the, the parallel there. And in one of your papers, you talked about how sugar is sort of seen as this unnatural processed food and even <laughs> that it has this crystalline appearance that's yeah. similar uh, to uh, other drugs and, and has similar extractive processes as cocaine and opium. And, and uh, it seems like the popular press really latches onto those things and, yeah. and draws parallels between them in a way that they wouldn't if they looked different and, and were yeah. produced differently. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's if you look at some of the imagery that comes around the, the kind of um, anti-sugar um, writing and journalism and books and so on uh, some one of the most common images is, is of a kind of pile a little sort of cone of sugar yes. on a dark surface it looks you know suspiciously sort of drug-like mm -hmm. um in this way or little bags of i mean you, you see some you know it's it, the you can't miss it really the the insinuation i mean i mean and i have seen there are a number of um researchers and and commentators who very explicitly make that point about well it's processed in the same way as cocaine or opium and i mean it, it, it's frankly kind of ridiculous <laughs> to say that because something looks like something else <laughs> it's the same kind of problem mm -hmm. and i think you know i don't think we you know sugar is not um is not necessary i'm not saying that sugar is a healthful food Mm -hmm. right um i'm not defending it in that sense and this is something i'm often accused of um basically sort of shilling for for coca-cola because mm -hmm. you have to be either either anti-sugar or right. you're pro-sugar and yeah. that's not my position at all what i'm trying to say is that we kind of by making this connection you i think you um over you exaggerate the threat that sugar poses for rhetorical purposes, which then smooths over a lot of the interesting differences in the way that we consume products that are not necessarily healthful. And that there's a great deal of kind of nuance and variation in the way that those products are consumed. So if we take sort of illicit drugs out of the pictures of mm -hmm. um, cocaine and, 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 and so on, but if we think about caffeine or alcohol, you know, for example, um, there's a very kind of complex picture about um, how we consume, what that, what the social meanings of that consumption are, and what kind of what the risks might be, and what you know what constitutes a risk, a short-term health risk, a long-term health risk, a social risk of not consuming, for example, of turning down a a treat that's been baked for you, mm. um, and so on. So I think you know the 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 kind of rush to the the reason the book is called sugar rush is obviously it's a play on the 
right. the idea of having a lot of sugar, but also about the rush to blame sugar, mm. the kind of piling on to sugar that I'm is that's what I'm interested in really, okay. um, and I think by piling on and drawing those um, parallels with um, drugs like cocaine, um, I think ends up losing so much of the important nuance about how and why sugar is kind of operating in our everyday consumption. Okay. And so what are some of the ways that you see that happening then, uh, that, that, that sugar operates in our daily consumption? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's, and a number of these would be seen as problematic by a lot of people, um, but they're also very pleasurable. So I think one thing is that sugar is very strongly associated with pleasure, but also affection, love, um, commensality, eating together, being together. You know, I mean, I still have very, I, have, I think we all have very fond memories of, of dishes, perhaps, that, or cakes that, that a, a beloved grandparent might have made, or a, mm -hmm. a candy or sweet that someone might have given, that you see it and you think of that person, mm -hmm. or the dish, you know, that your my mum might cook for me when I go home because she knows that I really like it. Yeah. There might be a nice sweet. And, and so I think, I think you have to take that pleasure seriously. I think it's, you know, it's often written off as a kind of uh, misplaced emotionality, you know, or an ignorance around it. But I think you have to take seriously the those those kind of meanings of sugar. So sugar is often referred to as empty, as empty calories. But actually, it's a it's a category of food that is absolutely laden with meaning. Um, that I think is really important. I think there is a, a whole issue that comes up in the newspaper coverage and in all the anti-sugar books that is quite interesting about sugar as being hidden, mm -hmm. um, which I, I find really interesting that, um, that sugar is in foods where you might not expect it to be, in savory foods, for example, where yeah. you, know, you wouldn't necessarily, oh, but pasta sauces are a really common target yeah. of this, you know, that they have added sugar in them yeah. and so on. And I, I think the idea of it not only being hidden, but also as hiding, um, which comes up quite a lot of sugars given this quite active personality as, as being kind of quite demonic as, as high and, and nefarious as hiding away and sort of doing all this hidden harm to our, to our bodies and also hiding in the body. So there's a lot of warnings, particularly in the anti-sugar self-help books, that it doesn't matter if you're slim, mm -hmm. that it's still like in your body, it's hidden in the body as well. And so when you eat sugar, it kind of, it gets dispersed around the body. It operates in the body in this unseen way. And so it's been given this quite kind of, um, yeah, unpleasant, um, quite sneaky, um, characterization that I find really a kind of interesting thing to attach to a food um, and it fits very well with this idea that we have good food and bad food which I find a, a very problematic way of categorizing um, categorizing our food and I think m most recently obviously it's really been it's like the the standard bearer the attack on sugar is the standard bearer bearer for the war on obesity mm -hmm. Now yeah. it's become um, synonymous with obesity. So when you're talking about sugar, you are talking about fatness, where sugar is seen as the now is positioned as the primary culprit in causing fatness, which then in turn is treated as as kind of quite catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's become kind of this um, the primacy of it. I think is is really important that it's become the the food enemy of the day in ways that makes it quite powerful. Yeah. And I'm just, okay. I'm, so I'm putting myself in the position of a parent listening to this podcast episode and thinking, okay, well that that's all well and good. And, yeah. and I can see how it's really interesting that people talk about hiding sugar. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't know sugar was in pasta sauce and, mm -hmm. or that it's distributed around the body. And I know it, it, their fatty liver is, is an issue where it sort of gathers yeah. around your liver as well. Um, but, but isn't, aren't we eating too much sugar and isn't that bad for us? <laughs> how, right. how do we hold those two things yeah. together? Um, well, I think the first thing, it depends who we is. Okay. That, um, you know, but the consumption varies enormously and what 
constitutes too much in terms of, again, if I go back to my discussion around poverty, um, somebody may be um, sharing with their family uh, processed foods that may be high in sugar or, you know, other uh, um, fat and salt and so on. Um, but that that may be the best way to feed children where they know that they will eat the food mm -hmm. and not be hungry, which is the primary health threat in the immediate term, having a hungry child. Mm -hmm. And and so there's there's not the luxury to think about long-term health risks or so on. So I think the we, who the we is, the we tends to refer to a very kind of middle-class sort of vision of eating. Yeah. Um, having said that, clearly sugar consumption has increased over say the last 30 years or so. Um, and as has the process, as, as processed food and so on. And it may be some kind of problem for sure. I'm not saying that sugar is, as I said, a healthful food. I'm not defending sugar. Mm -hmm. um, and But I think that for me, the immediate jump to sugar misses out lots of really important steps in thinking about food supply, food consumption, and who prepares the food? Whose job is it? If we have to reduce our sugar consumption by diligently reading labels, and making meals from scratch. Who is doing that work? Well, it's women who are doing that work, women who are already massively overstretched. So this is what I mean by needing to take a step back that the rush to sugar misses out all these other important steps that will be left unresolved, even if we reduce the amount of sugar that we eat. So I think, and I guess following on from that is the focus on sugar as bad stops us thinking about other kind of endemic health harms that are also related to obesity. Like if, if you if you feel like obesity is a serious problem, um, end, endocrine disruptors, um, sleep, um, sleep debt and so on and so on. That again, it's that silencing of the other conversations. And I don't really mean that as a kind of what about -ery, you know, what about this? What about that? Mm -hmm. But I think they're actually steps in a conversation that you know if you're a parent clearly on an everyday basis you have to decide what to feed your children mm -hmm. and there's a series of, de of decisions there and demands and I appreciate that and that people are trying to make the most difficult choices uh, the, the best choices um, often in very difficult circumstances but I think those other things that I was I was talking about are important because they are they're an invitation to stop and think about what is being made unspeakable by speaking about sugar. Okay. All right. And so um, something that's been <laughs> in the back of my mind for a few minutes now, and, and uh, one of the reasons we talked with Dr. Lindo Bacon is because mm. uh, they don't accept any funding from, uh, from industry. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you've talked a couple of times about not demonizing sugar. And I just want to be crystal clear, as it were. <laughs> do, do you accept any funding from the sugar industry from... from <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, okay. first of all, the sugar industry is not going to pay a feminist sociologist to do anything. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, that's the first thing. But also because if when you look at my work, I'm actually very critical mm -hmm. of those industries as well. Um, you know, there it, it would I would never. Uh, I would never accept that kind of money from those big companies, partly because I think I mean not just because not necessarily because of the products, but because of the. Um, um, the labor relations, environmental destruction, and, and all of those things as well. Um, but no, no. Um, I'm, okay. and, I, and I like to position myself as kind of um, um, constructively critical of both of both ends of this um, mm. the debate. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for for clarifying that. And so, uh, you you mentioned that you're a, a feminist sociologist, and we started talking a little bit about this ge mm. the gendered work that goes into yeah. uh, navigating sugar, understanding it, monitoring it, uh, which yeah is in in a heterosexual relationship is typically something yeah. that is taken on by the female mother in yeah. the household, um, and and not only does it become my work <laughs> to do this it's also my fault if yes. my child is rejecting certain foods or is in a body yeah. that is perceived in a certain way yeah um wh wh what do you say about that yeah i mean whenever we talk about food we're always talking about gender 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's always gendered, as you, as you say quite rightly. Who is preparing the food? Who's buying the food? Who's planning the food? So even where men are sharing that labor, it's off. It's usually women who are doing the remembering, the thinking, the you know, the writing the lists and those <laughs> kinds of things. Um, and I say this as I mean, I'm not a parent, um, and I've never parented a child, but I mean, there's there's ample evidence. Yes, that this is a you know a, a, a predominant pattern. So it is women's work, and so whenever you propose changes. Uh, interventions into consumption you're generally making more work for women and so what I feel about a lot of these sort of um, the the anti-sugar advocates is what I would like them to start off by talking about who's going to do this work Um, because this is a serious issue Um, and it's not just work then but then it's also guilt bearing Um, so it was a very common trope in the newspapers which I've called the um, the mortified mother story which is where you you um, you, you, they get a mother who's got, you know, two or three kids and then they, they do a food diary mm-hmm. for a day or a week. And then they count up how much sugar the kids are eating. And then basically the mother gets a ticking off from a nutritionist and she has to sort of mend her ways. Um, and then she ends up having to, you know, she's reading the labels. She's keeping a, a journal of how much sugar they're having. She's cooking food from scratch that she used to buy packaged food. And her labor is just kind of, escalating but it's not recognized as work because it's mothering Mm -hmm. and so it's completely invisible labor um, in that sense um, in the interest of others and we know that for example you know a lot of these the the um, these articles also talk about how can women then persuade their uh, male partners if we're sort of in that heteronormative uh, mode um, how can they sort of persuade their male partners to either help as, 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 it's, as it's called, or to, to eat differently. And so there's lots of advice out there about how you can kind of sneakily make changes mm-hmm. so that no one notices that you change the taste very slowly. But of course, it's the, the, the woman is doing all of the work on their behalf. And so I think that really matters because when a child is fat, for example, um, it is the, the mother who is targeted for blame that it's her fault. Mm -hmm. um because the child is is fat and that's seen as kind of catastrophic and a a failure of mothering i think the other way that it's gendered that i find quite interesting is that women are figured um as being kind of especially vulnerable to sugar Mm -hmm. you know that kind of the sweetie eater type um narrative Mm -hmm. um and and it's basically a way of um um making women childish so this idea that children have got, you know, children will eat sweets. Children have got a naturally sweet tooth mm-hmm. and women are kind of positioned as being like children mm-hmm. and unable to resist sweet foods and yeah, eating. Neither one has any self-control. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a kind of really interesting narrative there about who is most vulnerable to sugar and, and to its kind of temptations and who's able to control their own bodies. And women generally don't come out of this very well. Um, which again, I think should, and yet are expected to exercise control in all of these other ways. And of course, over their own bodies, the pressure on women to control their food consumption and to control and manage their body sizes is is compared to, I know men experience this kind of pressure, but the boundaries of acceptable body size and the pressure on women is a completely different order of things. Right. And and so there's this kind of tension that women have to navigate with, between being apparently just completely kind of seducible by sugar and yet needing to exercise absolute control at all times over their bodies and surveil their bodies and those of the children and men for whom they're, they're responsible. So I think gender has to be present there in this discussion about who's doing the work, who's carrying the blame. Um, in all of these discussions. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so just to sort of bring this from the the theoretical to the practical, when you say gender mm. has to be present in this discussion, um, what what does that mean for a family who is trying yeah. to understand? Uh, do I follow the World Health recommendation, World Health Organization recommendations for you know twenty five grams of sugar a day, which seems to be based mm-hmm. on really shaky evidence, mostly yes. connected to dental cavities rather than anything yes, else? Yes, it is. Um, what what do we actually do about this? Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, again, as I said, I'm not a parent, and I think mm-hmm. uh, not being a parent changes the dynamics of a household a lot. Yeah, um, is a very different dynamic. Although um, we know that the gender division of labour still persists 
whether there are children in the house or not generally um i think well i think i guess without wanting to kind of tell people what to do in situations that i haven't experienced um i think that the sharing of that work is is a really key step not just getting people on side in terms of shall we try and reduce the amount of sugar we're eating as a as a collective endeavor which i know michael goran's book is very much about that isn't it about a kind of family endeavor which yeah. you know i've got a lot of time for that kind of um it's a very um it's a kind of very generous um, generous and inclusive way of thinking about it as a family project mm -hmm. um and i've got a lot of time for that but that also has to include i think how is the work of this going to be done and who is going to do the work and if it doesn't work out who's going to get the blame for it that a lot of these projects are either explicitly or implicitly driven by women and and others sort of go along you know but are they cooking half the meals are they doing the shopping are they reading the labels are they calculating how many teaspoons of sugar the children have had mm -hmm. are they right you know if if you want to do that you know so i think for me it's that it's it's um this this doesn't happen by accident and that the work doesn't happen by accident right um, and yet it's made very invisible and so we're we're actually in a pretty interesting situation to be talking about this right now because we are doing the sugar proof experiment okay. to, to reduce sugar in our household we actually did it a couple right. weeks ago and then, then i found out that i'm i'm uh your mortified mother narrative is coming up you know i found out <laughs> that my daughter was in camp and they were feeding her uh popsicles yep. in the afternoon and so uh, i i i don't know that i felt that i failed but it was just kind of a uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, we're doing it again and uh and we're we're not being sort of super hardcore about it mm -hmm. but we are um sort of be, being very conscious about it and yes a lot of this work is is on me and yesterday we my daughter and i had to have a conversation with my uh husband who likes to eat this baked chocolate goodie in the morning that i had mm -hmm. happened to bake before i realized that we were we were going mm -hmm. to do this again and uh my daughter karis was saying well it's not fair that he eats that in front of me <laughs> <laughs> and so i was actually recording an interview yesterday while this conversation was happening in the background <laughs> i could yeah. kind of hear it in the next room and i uh, came out and sort of helped them to to reach an agreement that he would not eat this uh in front of her that mm -hmm. he wouldn't be prevented from having it but he would he would not eat yeah. it in front of her but yes it, it you know it, it not to say that he's not a an equal participant here but that yeah it's it's very much me and to some extent her saying you know what we we need some help from you on yeah. this too um yeah. and and i can ask him to cook and he will put two meals on the shopping list that he's he's going to be mm -hmm. um he's going to be responsible for cooking in the next two weeks but if i forget to ask and if I don't ask for yeah. them to be cooked that night, then it's not going to get cooked. Yeah. So yeah, we're 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 absolutely seeing that play out. Yeah. So I'm curious about how how would you shift this interaction yeah. a little bit? I mean, it's it's so difficult, isn't it? And I think one of the things about I think sugar in particular, but the kind of these things in general, they are these are very complicated things. Our attachment to food, our attachment to our roles in the household, because also there is a lot of pleasure to be had from mothering and caring and, and mm -hmm. providing food. And you know, I'm not saying this is all just sort of torture and torment. Yeah. Um, you know, by any means. But I think these are very complicated things. And I think one of the things that feminism actually that feminist thought had, can teach us about this is that you can be as aware as you like of the gendering of certain social practices and ideas and it, there's not always that easy to change and we can think about body dissatisfaction for example i work within critical fat studies i'm very sympathetic to linda bacon's ideas for example mm -hmm. um i think i have you know a fairly well developed understanding of how these kind of discourses of fat oppression and so on are operating and so on and yet you know <laughs> much as i try not to i still have you know I still have those moments when I'm just like, oh, you know, my life would be so much better if I were 20 pounds lighter, mm -hmm. you know, and I know that's nonsense, but it's it's those things you can't just step outside of them for knowing that they are a problem. And I think it's the same with domestic relations, because, you know, we, these are people who we we love, we care for, we've built lives with, we've fallen into habits around who does what. These are 
these are tricky things to challenge and change. And I think, you know, so I, I think it's important not to think of any of this as, as straightforward, just as changing what we eat is not necessarily straightforward either, because we have habitual pat patterns of eating, having your chocolate treat in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever the thing is that you, that, you know, that habit that you have. And I think that it's really important to be kind to ourselves when we look at our social relations, when we look at our eating habits, at the way we think about our own bodies and to kind of think about, you know, not, not allow this idea that we're all kind of individually able to take responsibility for all these things to kind of take over to the point where we end up just feeling like we're failing the whole time. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that that perspective of, um, of, of not seeing this as a failure, you know, my, my daughter has a cookie from somewhere. That's not a failure. Yeah. That's not a failure on me. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, she, she had a cookie and, and, you know, the world didn't end, yes. um, you know, it's, it's, I think, I think with food, um, that the absolute is, is a problem Yes. in many ways. Yeah. And I think the good, bad is a problem thinking about food is good, bad, because then we think about bodies as good, about good or mm -hmm. bad. Do I have a good body? Do I have a bad body? Yeah. And I think those absolutes and binaries become really, really problematic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that sort of leads into what one of the discourses that's kind of popular right now is around our bodies being evolved to seek mm. out sugar to help us lay down fat yeah. in preparation for times of scarcity. Um, because our bodies are built to equip, built to live and exist in a world where sugar isn't available all the time. And yeah. now it is available all the time. What, what do you make of that discourse? Um, I mean, this has come up a lot through the kind of paleo Mm -hmm. type diets the um the low carb high fat there's lots of sort of versions of that um and we so we hear about that a lot and then this this broader explanation about that we want sweet food and again it's very strongly associated with babies and the fact that breast milk is very sweet and and it's sort of a, an, a, a taste that we have um my my feeling about these claims is that they're incredibly vague um and that they presume a kind of natural or pure state from which we have deviated and it's a pure state of, of of like being driven by our desires in an environment that provides us with what we need i mean that's the the imagined sort of purity of it that you'd be you know you'd come across a tree full of berries every so often you'd scarf them down and you get your sugar your sugar rush um but you're not having them every day mm -hmm. um but I think one of the, the my concerns about this is that a lot of this is based on research around um, eating habits that we really don't know very much about. Um, we're talking about a massive period of time that the, the, the period of time that's being referred to is massive, absolutely massive. It's also incredibly geographically dispersed. And so there's, you know, in, in a sense, if you really look at these different eating practices, what you could say is the human body is incredibly adaptable mm -hmm. um, in terms of how what it can survive on. But there's a kind of generalization around hunter gathering, an image of it that is it actually assumes a great deal of uniformity across a huge span of time. The other thing that bothers me about it is a lot of it is based on research um, and particularly the sort of the paleo side of it is based on on research that was done basically by colonial powers um by white men going to visit um sort of modern day hunter gatherers so sort of surviving hunter gatherer um communities without and for, one of the first thing is that they tended to only follow the men because they thought that they were the most important um things so if the men are hunting you're going to get you're going to see hunting mm -hmm. but not see the the everydayness of also the sort of vegetable and fruit um, gathering and, and production. But also, even if you look at the kind of archeological data, um, the, you'll, you'll get remains from hunting because there'll be bones and, and tools and so on. But obviously the vegetables that were and fruits that were consumed don't leave any trace. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't look like they ate that. I mean, of course they're not eating sugar in the, the right. sort of processed bag of sugar sense, but um, so there's that. Um, so what we see people doing and what's being gathered, but also looking at modern day hunter gatherers who communities who don't, that don't eat traditionally eat very much sugar um, are also profoundly affected 
by colonialism and the violence of colonialism. And if we think about, there's often um, people talk about Aboriginal communities, for example, who have terrible problems with um, diabetes and cancers and so on. Um, and that sugar is often held responsible for this. But what we, we're not talking about is the, the horrendous racism and dispossession that has forced people into a particular pattern of eating. So again, to, to kind of control the amount of sugar these individuals are eating is really scratching at the surface. So I think, you know, clearly we're eating more sugar than we used to. Um, we're eating more um, refined sugar and processed and processed food. Um, whether, whether you can then say that there is a pure kind of self that precedes the contemporary body i'm i'm not convinced by that because we know that bodies um change if we think about epigenetics and that each generation's food and exposure to to the environment changes the way the body responds to food and the way that genes are kind of expressed the idea that we could ever return to this pure kind of pre-social um self seems very problematic to me Okay, so so where are we headed then? If, in if what we sense? can't go back to uh, this this pre-social, you know, pre mm. ideal hunter gatherer body that that didn't, uh, or I guess existed in a world that didn't have sugar, we're we're not in that world anymore. No, um, we're not. Clearly, we can't go back to that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Are we headed into a world where we 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 need to be the ones who controls this? Are we need Are we headed into a world where we're looking to companies to control this, to governments to control our access mm. to sugar, um, or something else, some other model? Where Where are we going? Do you think? Mm. I mean, again, I think it's hugely variegated on the on the basis of class, for example, and yeah. access. Like, who's heading in which direction? I mean, you can see, you know, a whole a whole kind of tranche of perhaps people like myself people like you who I'm I'm white I'm middle class I'm very privileged I have a good income I you know I can control my own food um, I have the the social and cultural capital um, to cook a particular you know particular kinds of food to prepare foods and so on um, where you can see a, a narrative of control is very appealing from that perspective I see myself as controlling my body and my diet whereas actually you know I, it's only that's a that's a facet of my privilege and to, to be able to do that mm -hmm. and so I think it, in a sense again I keep saying this but it comes back to these issues of inequality and who has access to what resources I mean clearly there are the you know the the, the food companies the big food companies are I don't think we should be surprised that they're so kind of um powerful and and you know, so investing so heavily in marketing and, and in the products that they're making, but they clearly um, don't necessarily have uh, people's um, health and best interests at heart. Um, but at the same time, by by just, so for example, banning um, fast food jo um, joints in certain areas, which is something that's been sort of um, posited a lot in the UK. So in particular poor areas to stop fast food joints opening mm -hmm. and so on. Um, again, it comes back to this, this thing, well, why could you not make those poor areas less poor? Um, because we know that when people have more money, when they have more job security, when they have you know, proper pay, live in a, health, a healthy environment, um, they, they, eat, they eat better and they are healthier, that the biggest predictor of illness is poverty. That's it's if we look at the work of Michael Marmot, it's 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 really well established. So I think, you know, to to talk about sugar or to talk about obesity, actually, I think as well is is a distraction. In the sense from this broader issue, while at the same time wanting people to be able to um, make food choices that work for them, that make sense to them. But at the same time, I think it also has to be an acceptance that the choices that people may make may not be the ones that um, those making the policies have in mind. Mm -hmm. But at least um, they're they would be choices, right? Rather yeah. than uh, yeah. 
something you have to do because that's yeah. the only option that's available to you. Yeah, and and uh, I, some of the examples in some of your papers about the way that this is classed, I, I hadn't realized. Uh, I, I think this this shows up particularly in the UK with the the sugar tree farm reality show, which mm -hmm. I'd never heard of, and um, and and you cited a newspaper article where Peter Davison, who all of my UK listeners will know who he is, yeah. <laughs> he was Doctor Who. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you know who Doctor Who is. <laughs> um, I guess he collapsed and was taken away in an ambulance when when they're on this sort of sugar free diet, and the, and this you know newspaper is making fun of him because it wasn't the working class woman from Essex, which which is actually where I'm from <laughs> yeah. originally, uh, who that they would expect to be the weakling. You know, he he was mm -hmm. sort of reduced. His 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 middle class status wasn't a protective factor for him in that environment. No, because he, it turns out that he was eating more sugar than uh, and then when he they stopped him he, he stopped eating sugar uh, and the effect on his body was um it sort of completely felled him mm. um yeah and there was this shock that it wasn't um i think it was Gemma collins wasn't it he yeah. was from a show called the only way is essex yeah um <clears throat> and uh, and there was this real kind of like well, who would have thought that the kind of middle class white man would have um would have been so kind of taken over by sugar mm. but i think we can also see it more broadly in this, this classness in the assumption that working class people cannot be trusted to manage their own desires. Um, and so another good example is um, the, the celebrity chef, Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with yeah. him, if your audience will be familiar I, I with him. I think my my listeners may not, but I know of him <laughs> from connections. Yeah. I mean, he's quite a kind of, he's kind of public school educated, yeah. quite posh um, celebrity chef yeah. um, who, who's kind of very interested in sort of social causes. And, and he he got into he did a program called Britain's Fat Fight mm. um, on, on the BBC. And um, as part of that, he launched a campaign called WH Sugar, which is a play on a high street store called WH Smith's yeah. um, that, that really targets a working class demographic. It sells newspapers and comics and books and stationery and, and sweets and snacks. Mm. And, and it's it it does that thing with a with the aisles leading up to the checkout where they maybe have chocolate. Or, or they'll have the big bars of chocolate on the checkout, which you can buy cheap for, you know, cheap if you buy something else. Yeah. And so he started this campaign about this and, and sort of would go into these stores or photograph himself surrounded by bars of chocolate and things. But what really struck me that the campaign was about kind of protecting working class people from their own inability to resist temptation. And we never, ever get a sense that he is tempted by it. He's in this space, but he's not tempted, right? But someone else might be. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of completely unspoken sense of, of his kind of white male privilege and in a sense sort of protecting him from the weaknesses of others and that you have to go in and, and, and stop other people being exposed to it. Otherwise they will consume to excess. Mm -hmm. And so there is, and I think this for me connects to what I see as being one of the broader um, issues that is framing the attack on sugar um, and that is the connection to austerity in the UK um, so for, for those who aren't familiar with this it was really comes around after the financial crash and around 2012 2013 we had a whole series of policies under the David Cameron's um, conservative um, government that basically reduced welfare support cut all public services and it came with a narrative that people who made claims on benefits on the welfare system were over consuming public resources to the detriment of the health service of the nation's ability to, to prosper. And they became targets as kind of skivers um, and, and scroungers getting, getting more than they deserved, sort of illegitimately. And the, the attack on sugar starts in the UK at almost exactly the same time. Mm. And the language, so I'm not saying one caused the other, right? <laughs> but they kind of fed each other that yeah. the language of austerity is completely embedded in the language of anti-sugar. So of people over consuming, of people um, not taking care of themselves and therefore becoming reliant on the state and, and using the health service mm. um, and wrecking the health service and so on. And then the language of economy starts coming up. The idea that um, it comes up with, with cuts in benefits. People were told, well, if you if you bought sensibly, if you you know if you were 
uh, careful with your money, you, you would have enough. And the same comes with the sugar where people are being encouraged to make these tiny economies do a teaspoon saving here, a teaspoon saving there, a teaspoon saving there, and it won't even be a problem. It'll be really easy. Mm -hmm. And and so the language kind of it fed into it that we had these kind of image of these working class people over consuming and unable to control their consumption and then being urged to make these sort of tiny economies for the sake state for the sake of the nation and to protect the health service. And so the language kind of it fed, they fed into each other and really gave it um it gave it some force in the uk context mm -hmm. anyway yeah and I'm, I'm not sure we've seen the same here when not having the massive social <clears throat> support to begin with yeah, that could yeah. have been cut, but... <laughs> <laughs> at least we had it yes yeah. yes exactly okay um and so so as we sort of come to a conclusion here to to me the the macro level uh path is somewhat clear we we shouldn't be focusing on telling people what to eat we should be focusing on alleviating poverty on raising everybody's standard of living mm. so that nobody is forced to eat a certain food because that's the only food that they can afford that they that they should be able to choose what food yeah. they eat and they may not choose to eat what the traditional uh, sort of middle class white view of a yeah. balanced diet is, but at least they have a choice. I, I'm curious to mm -hmm. see firstly whether you agree with that, and secondly, uh, on a on a micro level, on a yeah. on an individual family level, uh, I I know you don't make prescriptions. You're very clear in your work that you don't make prescriptions about yeah. what people should eat. But but what what advice would you leave yeah. parents with who are navigating this yeah. in their own families? Yeah, I mean, first of all, yes, I on that macro level, I think the question should always be about kind of poverty and inequality, not about a specific food item that right. sugar is not responsible for these kind of like, like devastating inequalities that we have in the UK, I know in the US as well. Um, so on that level, but um, and, and, and I think that's important because I think sugar is being used as a distraction, not necessarily by people like, you know, people like Michael Gorin and so on, who are, you know, engaging in a specific kind of health mission, but I think politically, certainly it's being used as a distraction. So there's that on the practical level. I mean, having, as you say, having said that, we all still have to decide what to have for tea tonight. We do. <laughs> you know, we all have to decide what to eat um, and and all of those things. And so it's all very well to say we have to resolve poverty. But, you know, um, someone who's got kids has got to give them something to eat and decide. So there are a series of difficult decisions. I think for me personally, it's been really interesting working on sugar um it hasn't it hasn't actually changed my attitude to sugar but i also um having said i don't agree with absolute prescriptions on food i'm a vegan and so i absolutely <laughs> don't eat a whole kind of <laughs> a whole kind of set of foods um yeah. you know for a very specific set of, of ethical um reasons i also don't drink caffeine for, for health reasons because i don't sleep and so i i feel like i already have quite a lot of restriction food restriction and I'm very concerned about piling restriction on restriction um, in that sense but having said that because of you know the privilege that I enjoy I I eat a uh, you know largely I uh, will eat an entirely plant-based diet largely made from scratch I don't eat processed food because I can you know have the time and, and money to cook uh, food that I like for myself and so I'm in a very privileged position I don't have children if I had children um, I think I would want them to um to know about food to know food to have a, a choice of food to try different foods to know what it's like to cook and handle food to know how much food costs you know what's expensive food what isn't um to build their skills if you like in in choosing their in choosing their diet as they grow as they get older i would want to limit the amount of um fast food and, and heavily processed food that they ate, mostly because I would want them to be eating something else, like, to, you know, those things. But at the same time, I think that I, if I had a child, I would want her to know that whatever size or shape her body is, she's fabulous. And that it doesn't say anything about who you are as a person. And it's not a moral, it's not an achievement to be thin. It's we have a diversity of bodies and I would want her to know that and then to be able to be um, sympathetic and understanding of some of the different struggles that people have with that so I mm -hmm. think I would want them to be able to develop their own tastes develop their own um, skills um, 
with food and make choices, make informed choices, but also to be understanding about other bodies and to enjoy food. I was waiting for that. <laughs> but to take, I think I was so much to see whether you would say that. So much of the anti-sugar um, campaigning is is rather joyless. Yeah, actually, um, <laughs> yeah. a I think it fails to recognise the pleasure to recognize as legitimate some of the pleasure that we get from this kind of food, mm -hmm. but also food as, as pleasure, not just as a kind of, um, in terms of taste, but also socially as being very pleasurable mm -hmm. as well and very important. And I think I would, want, I would want children to learn that, you know, food is a site, an important site of pleasure as well. And, and it doesn't need to be governed by kind of constant rules and prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that maybe that even that aspect of it holds holds as much weight as the the caloric and the nutrient intake that you're getting. That we shouldn't neglect that and see that as something that's irrelevant or you know don't don't even pay attention to it. But that is an integral part of what eating means. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I don't know if you've seen the work by um, Scrinis, and uh, he talks about Kyogi Scrinis, who talks about nutritionism, which is a uh, a kind of the way the governing way of thinking about food which sees it own entirely in terms of the nutrients that it, yeah. that it holds rather than thinking about foods or eating or, or those kind of broader practices yeah awesome so a whole lot of relax then <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it it is easy to say if you don't have children yes um you know and i would never want to tell anyone how to bring up their children because it's never something i've done and i would have been terrible at it so. <laughs> <laughs> no i thought the same too <laughs> never had any desire to do this job but here we are all right well yep. thank you so much for uh, for for really sort of pushing our thinking on this in in ways that the challenges some of the conventional ideas around sugar in in specific and and eating more broadly as well i really appreciate your time Thank you very much for having me. And so uh, all of the references for the papers that we've discussed today can be found at yourparentingmojo.com forward slash sugar rush.